Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Today, our topic is HDL cholesterol, and we'll be speaking with Dr. Mark Houston. Um, the focus of HDL cholesterol, which has been called the so-called good cholesterol, is that this molecule could potentially help to prevent and reverse cardiovascular disease. Much of the research about heart disease has really been focused on the so-called bad cholesterol, the LDL which is now generally seen as a significant player in the formation of atherosclerotic plaques in the artery walls that can lead to heart attacks, strokes, and heart failure over time. Many of the cardiovascular medications are designed to lower LDL levels, including statins, niacin, zetia, uh, pembidoic acid, and the new PCSK9 inhibitors. And there are a number of nutraceuticals that are also effective at lowering LDL particles, including Reggie's rice, fish oil, plant sterols, niacin, berberine, among others. We also know that the proper diet and exercise can also be very effective in reducing LDL cholesterol in our bodies, especially the more atherogenic, small, dense LDL particles. But today we're going to be focused on the so-called good cholesterol, HDL. We, we, we're going to go into how to understand it, how it works, and how we can improve HDL to improve our cardiovascular health. We first learned about the potential benefits of HDL cholesterol about 70 years ago. And in 1977, we learned through the Framingham Heart Study that low levels of HDL are generally associated with increased risk of coronary artery disease. And we, we thought at one time that simply the more HDL, the higher the levels, the better off we are. But our thinking about this has changed as we have learned that the HDL story is much more complex than we thought it was. And drugs that were developed to raise HDL have really failed to be effective in reducing heart attacks or death. In fact, some people with very high levels of HDL may actually be more at risk for heart disease. And so this is why we've asked uh, the expert, Dr. Mark Houston, to join us to explain what current knowledge about HDL cholesterol is and how we can use this to prevent or reverse heart disease. Dr. Mark Houston is a internal medical doctor and hypertension and cardiovascular specialist. He's a go-to expert on cardiovascular disease in the functional medicine world. He's the director of the Hypertension Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Houston is triple board certified in hypertension as an, Americans, a, 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 as an American Society of Hypertension Specialist and Fellow of the American Society of Hypertension, Internal Medicine, and Anti-Aging Medicine. He also has a master's degree in human nutrition and a master's of science degree in functional and metabolic medicine from the University of South Florida. Dr. Houston teaches doctors around the world about cardiovascular medicine as part of the uh, A4M programs. Dr. Yusin is also a very prolific author, having written What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Hypertension, What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Heart Disease, Nutritional and Integrative Strategies in Cardiovascular Medicine, uh, Nutritional and Integrative Strategies in Cardiovascular Medicine, and his two latest books, which are Vascular Biology for the Clinician, and precision and personalized integrative cardiovascular medicine. Dr. Houston, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Ben. It's a pleasure to be with you as always. So maybe you can give us a little bit of a um, uh, explanation in general. What is HDL? In fact, what is LDL? Why do, why do these molecules exist at all? Well, let's start with the uh, LDL story first, because I think people are most familiar with that one explain why it exists, and then we'll merge into the HDL story a bit. Um, these molecules are termed apolipoproteins in the medical world. 
And apolipoproteins exist for good reasons. Uh, we have to have them for a lot of health benefits. For example, one of the major benefits of all the types of cholesterol, whether it be LDL or HDL, is a immunological function. It actually protects you from any type of infection, whether it's viral, bacterial, parasitic, fungal, or TB. And it's also part of our metabolic system for making steroids and vitamin D and sex hormones. So there's a teleological explanation for why these lipids were important in the early time to protect people from getting serious infections and dying from them. And so over time, what has happened is the uh, functionality, the levels of HDL and LDL have changed because in our modern society, people don't die so much of infections anymore, but they're dying from other types of environmental toxins, uh, nutritional problems, obesity, and a myriad of other risk factors like diabetes. And so what has happened to our cholesterol levels, particularly LDL and, and, and to a lesser extent HDL, they're going in the wrong direction in an attempt perhaps to protect us from these various types of environmental insults. So um, LDL, for example, uh, if it's protecting us from something, uh, it tends to go to very high levels. Uh, the LDL level is elevated, and then what's called LDL particle number becomes elevated, which is the driving risk for coronary heart disease and MI. Uh, there's also genetic forms of you know, dyslipidemia, but most people who have dyslipidemia in this country, it's environmental. It's not genetic. Um, so LDL has been considered, as you said, the bad cholesterol. And HDL is considered the good cholesterol, but it's much more complicated, obviously, than that. And that's what we'll get into today. So that's sort of an introduction. And we can, you know, kind of uh, banter back and forth with questions as you wish. So um, we generally think of HDL. Its main function is to produce reverse cholesterol transport, right? Right. And so what exactly happens during that process? So reverse cholesterol transport, or RCT, also termed cholesterol efflux capacity, or CEC, are the primary functions of HDL that go into the cell, attach to the cell wall through various receptors. They pick up the LDL, just like a garbage truck, and then take it to the liver, where it dumps the LDL and it's excreted into the bile. That's the normal process. However, if HDL, RCT, and CEC are not working, or HDL becomes, we say, less functional, then that process does not occur. LDL accumulates in the cell, and then that starts the LDL process of particle size going up, LDL levels going up, LDL size being smaller, and then you get atherosclerosis, coronary heart disease. And so HCL can actually take the cholesterol from the artery walls, right? And so it can reduce plaques potentially. That's right. It's, uh, it can literally take them out of the cell, but also take them from the cholesterol wall itself. And it's very important in reducing plaque rupture and improving plaque stability in coronary heart disease. And what's the significance of plaque stability? So there's, there's at least two, maybe three major forms of plaque. Uh, there's the vulnerable plaque, which has a very aggressive core in the middle composed of lipids and smooth muscle cells and inflammatory cells. And it's surrounded by a, 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 a sort of a, a firm top that is very thin. And that, that protective top can rupture. So what happens is all this activity inside the plaque can eat through this protective coating or cap and rupture into the arterial wall. Once that spews out into the artery, it causes acute thrombosis, which is an acute myocardial infarction. That's the, the really bad type of plaque. It's considered soft plaque. It's usually not calcified as vulnerable. The other plaque is one that has a much thicker cap 
and has less of a activity in the center with less lipids and inflammatory cells. And because it's more stable, it's not as likely to rupture, but over time it can become very obstructive and impede the blood flow through the artery. The problem we have is those people who have stable plaque may not have any symptoms whatsoever until they get to a 95 plus percent stenosis. But the ones who have unstable plaque, the ones that have the really thin cap, those can be only a 50% blockage, but they tend to rupture. And those are the ones that typically present with intense training, like they run a marathon, uh, interval training, whatever, and the plaque ruptures, and they have an acute MI even without much obstructive disease. And those soft plaques wouldn't be picked up, for example, by a coronary artery scan. Those can be completely missed because they're not necessarily calcified and they can be missed by exercise echo and nuclear medicine scans and other non-invasive ways of looking at plaque because it's uh, only maybe 50%, so it doesn't obstruct the flow. So what's the best way to get a clue as to whether those exist or not? You can do other testing, for example, you can do MRI imaging with contrast of the heart, which can pick up any type of plaque, soft or hard. Um, And there's uh, other types of metabolic testing called a PET scan, which picks up activity of plaque in the arteries. You can do a CTA, CT angiogram, looking at plaque. And of course, the gold standard is a coronary arteriogram where you actually inject dye into the coronary arteries. Is the, is the MRI being used regularly? I haven't heard of it being used that often. We, we use it routinely in the Institute. Uh, we have an MRI scanner, uh, and it's incredibly accurate for plaque, but also for uh, valve function, cardiac contractility, diastolic dysfunction. It's, uh, it's expensive, but if you have a patient that needs it and get it pre-approved by the insurance, It's extremely valuable when you don't want to do an arteriogram, but also there's no radiation exposure, uh, usually not much, you know, with a contrast or some, but you can't do it in people who have metal. So, you know, pacemakers and artificial joints, you you can't put them in an MRI. Right. So, so we have a, a number of positive functions of HDL, making plaques more stable, um, helping to, do reverse cholesterol transport. And, and in, in recent years, we've learned about the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties as well. Right. Uh, HDL uh, is composed of probably over 100 different molecules, proteins, and lipids, and other components. And with that degree of um, composition being so complex, it has a very complex anti-atherosclerotic effect. You mentioned a few, uh, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, anti-immunologic, which means it reduces vascular immunologic damage in the arteries, reverse cholesterol transport. I mean, there's probably 25 or 30 different um, beneficial effects of HDL uh, on atherosclerosis prevention. But the, the key point here is that no matter what your HDL level is, and no matter how, what the size of HDL is, those used to be thought to be protective or good things, but now it turns out that those don't actually tell you the true risk in an individual. The only thing that really gives you the true risk is the functionality of the HDL. Now, in a population, if you look at, you know, statistically, you know, is your HDL level this or is your HDL size this? There's a correlation in a population. But if you take an individual and you measure their HDL total, you measure their HDL size, whether it's big or small, and you measure the HDL map, and there's five forms of HDL from pre-beta all the way up, those may look great on paper, but that patient may still be at risk for coronary heart disease because you didn't measure the true value and true risk, which is functionality of the HDL. Does it do all the things it's supposed to do to protect you? Now, why is it that drugs that have been developed to raise HDL have all failed so far? 
There's a lot of reasons. Some of the studies were, were just bad studies. They didn't okay. have the right population. Um, another is they had other adverse effects, like one of the drugs raised blood pressure, and that counterbalanced the effects of HDL. But what happened is all of the studies were done prior to the understanding, really, of what HDL function was all about. So they may have raised HDL, but it wasn't functional HDL. So, it, you know, we had HDL, maybe it went up 30 to 50 percent, but it didn't work. So there was no reduction, as you said, in MI or total mortality with it. Right. So what is the best way to measure HDL and HDL functionality? There are two labs that uh, are presently available clinically to measure functionality of HDL. And that's really the key to getting at the risk for a patient in their coronary heart disease and MI risk. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, Ben, we're in the process of completing a large clinical trial on HDL functionality, uh, looking at a nutraceutical uh, compound that not only improves HDL function, but also can improve HDL size um, and also HDL particle number, which is another thing I neglected to mention earlier. And I, let me just maybe comment on that while we're talking about it. Uh, HDL function is the most important thing to measure. So we can do that now clinically. HDL particle number how many particles of HDL do you have is also very high correlated with HDL functionality. And you can measure this in traditional labs that do advanced lipid testing. So when you look at those two, there's like a 90% correlation between HDL particle number and HDL functionality. Yeah, but what we're trying to do is see which of those has the best overall predictability in a population and see if we can actually improve both of those numbers. And then when it comes to particle size, you want larger HDL particles? That's what we used to think, but that now has not turned out to be correct either because um, there's labs that do HDL mapping and there's five HDLs, pre-beta and alpha one, alpha two and others. They range from very small to, to the large ones. For example, the pre-beta, which is a really small one, is the one that actually picks up the uh, HDL, uh, no, excuse me, that picks up the LDL out of the cell. So if your pre-beta is not working well, you can't do good transport out of the cell. But then it, as the HDL matures, it goes to different sizes. And that progress across there involves a lot of different enzymes, a lot of different complexities. But eventually it gets to the form of HDL, which takes it and dumps it into the liver through the what's called scavenger receptor, SR1 receptor in the, in the liver. So you've got to have all five of these. And we used to think, well, the big one's like a big dump truck and it can make more, it carry more LDL with it. Turns out the size turns out to be not a great predictor, uh, not, nor does the actual total HDL level for heart disease. Now, uh, I heard um, one uh, prominent uh, functional medicine doctor talk about measuring APOA and um, that being um, maybe a better marker than HDL. What's, what, what's the relationship between APOA and HDL, and is there a value in measuring APOA? There's APOA1 and APOA2. And those are the carriers for HDL. So that's the apolipoprotein we mentioned earlier. And they are probably a little bit better than HDL total, but even those do not correlate well with risk because neither of those are functional tests. You're, again, just measuring apolipoprotein as a carrier for HDL, and it can be, again, dysfunctional. So, for example, if you measured total HDL, in a population, you could say, well, if it's between, maybe you say, we'll just throw out some numbers here, 30 to 100. Um, if you're below 30, you're probably in trouble. Uh, and if you're over 100, you're probably in trouble because those tend to be people who have more dysfunctional HDL. There's actually a study that was done in men and women, and it suggested that if, if a male 
was over around 50 or 55 of their total HDL. Most of it was likely to be dysfunctional. And a female, if it was over 75 to 80, was more likely to be dysfunctional. And that's because these tend to build up in the blood because they're trying to cancel the, the bad effects of the ALDL. So you make more and more of it, but as you make more of it, it's more dysfunctional. So the levels keep going up, but less of it's actually working. Hmm. And what is the relationship between oxidized LDL and uh, myeloperoxidase and HDL functionality? So uh, all of those are inflammatory and oxidative stress measurements. Um, oxidized LDL is the form that is atherogenic. So LDL when it's circulating in the regular serum is not atherogenic until it's modified into a oxidized or some other form. There's different forms of LDL that are called modified LDL. And that's the one that go across the vascular endothelium and actually cause damage or plaque formation. Uh, myeloperoxidase or MPO is a compound that's actually made by the white blood cell. And MPO causes all kinds of havoc. Well, it's, it's good that it kills bacteria, but if you keep making MPO due to other reasons, it causes high blood pressure, coronary heart disease, atherosclerosis, and even plaque rupture. It's a bad actor and increases coronary artery calcium. So MPO has both inflammatory and oxidative stress uh, implications. Now, once you develop those, they are the cause for atherosclerosis and myocardial infarction. So your HDL uh, has to be around to clean that up. But what happens when you have a high oxidative stress and MPO level, it damages HDL and it makes it dysfunctional. So when your MPO is high, you can say, well, chances are my HDL is not functioning well. Hmm. So what's the best way to improve HDL functionality? What we've developed uh, is a nutraceutical product that went, underwent an um, initial study with uh, 10 patients just to see if we could demonstrate effects. And that's actually published as a white paper through, can I mention a name of the company? Is that sure. okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the initial study with 10 patients with, with Metagenics. And then they uh, ask us to do a double-blind placebo control trial, which is really the way to get uh, the, the true data. Um, the initial trial showed that the uh, nutraceutical proprietary compound that we've developed is called Cardiolux, Cardiolux. Um, and it's got pomegranate, it's got quercetin, uh, curcumin, vitamin E, and a few other things in it looked positive in the initial pilot trial of 10 patients. So we're in the process of finishing the double blind control trial now will be then done April 15th. I don't know the results because I'm blinded and we'll do the statistical analysis. We will then publish the trial in a journal and we'll know the true efficacy of Cardiolux in these patients. Now, why did you pick those particular nutritional compounds? It's based on all the scientific trials uh, that are in the literature, uh, plus what we've done in patients over the years, trying to figure out which works the best. And when you take each one of those, it improves HDL function. Each one of those uh, also has other good effects on reducing oxidative stress, inflammation, and immune dysfunction. And all of them actually had an effect on raising total HDL and improving the HDL mapping and the HDL particle number. So the only missing piece was, uh, can we uh, put all this together into one product and take the best of each and make the entire picture better, but specifically concentrating on HDL functionality? Yeah, the interesting thing is those particular compounds, we generally think of a lot of them more as antioxidants than as cardiovascular-related compounds. Yeah, and, and that's exactly correct, because it may be that what we're doing when we reduce oxidative stress and inflammation, if we're making the HDL uh, compound, which has all these proteins and lipids in it, work better. Uh, so the functionality actually gets, gets improvement. And the other thing we've seen, Ben, is 
when HDL becomes dysfunctional, it's not all or none. And so think of it, like we'll just pick a number. Let's say you've got 100 different components in HDL. And let's say 20 of them become damaged, but the other 80 work well. So that HDL still functions, but just not at 100%. Whereas you can go all the way down to zero, everything gets wiped out and you have no function whatsoever. So the two tests that we use actually give you the ability to measure the functionality of HDL with a number. So you can see where you are on the scale from that 100% great to zero, which is terrible. So a, a lot of this functionality has to do with the proteins. And it's, it's my understanding that the basically... Um, the reason why you have these LDL, HDL particles is because, um, you know, fats don't move readily through the bloodstream uh, because that's more water soluble. So we surround them with these protein structures. So you have all these various proteins that are coating the, um, the, the lipids in the HDL. And um, one of these proteins is PON1, I understand, which is an important right. one. Yeah, you're, what you said is exactly right, Ben. Uh, you have to package the lipids into a water-soluble form, which is apolipoprotein. And so one of the proteins you mentioned is called PON, peroxinase. And peroxinase is incredibly important to make HDL function. And if it's damaged, HDL does not work well. And what we found in all the different compounds we were looking at, most of these raise PON. Uh, which helps to improve the functionality. It's kind of interesting how in the body, if you want to get something into the bloodstream, that's a fat, you have to make it water soluble. And then uh, in a lot of other areas, we're taking um, things that are water soluble and surrounding them with lipids so we can get them into the cell membranes. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a, a conundrum of how to get it into the blood, but also get sure into the cell. Right. Like even the, uh, a couple of the new um, vaccines for COVID actually take the RNA uh, 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 instructions and surround them with uh, a lipophilic uh, surrounding to get them into the cells. Yeah, exactly. And we do the same thing with glutathione and other ingredients that we're trying to get incorporated into our cells. Yeah, and actually we've, uh, uh, another compound that we use that everybody is familiar with is coenzyme Q10. Well, the problem with coenzyme Q10 is it's got to get into the mitochondria. So it's not only got to get into the cell, it's got to get into the mitochondria to be effective. And a lot of the CoQ10s, they get into the serum, fine, but they don't even get into the cell. But if they get to the cell, they don't penetrate the mitochondrial membrane. So there's, uh, there's new forms of CoQ10 development now that get into the mitochondria at a, at a concentration that's you know, like a thousand times greater than regular CoQ10. And so we've able, been able to reduce, you know, congestive heart failure, uh, improve ejection fractions, reduce diastolic dysfunction using a, um, a very highly potent CoQ10 that gets into the mitochondria. Is, the is that like the ubiquinol versus the ubiquinone? No, it's actually called MitoQ. Oh, right, yeah, right, from, right. It's from, it's from New Zealand. I heard about that. I saw a study where it like reversed, um, uh, what was it like um, aortic uh, um, uh, stenosis or something like that? Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, we've actually, I've got a series now of about 10 patients who were on the transplant list for a cardiac transplant list. Uh, and also a couple that were at end stage uh, coronary heart disease that they couldn't put stents in, they couldn't do bypass. Every one of them that we put on CoQ10 has become asymptomatic with no chest pain for their coronary heart disease or their ejection fraction has gone up significantly and they're off the transplant list. That's this stuff is a, a breakthrough, I think, in cardiology. Oh, interesting. Are you still using the combination of the CoQ10 and the uh, ribose and the L-carnitine for the... Yeah, we still use the uh, metabolic system. cardiology program. So we use regular CoQ10 for the vasculature CoQ10, MitoCo, MitoQ for the heart, and we use D-ribose, taurine, carnitine, magnesium, and all these other wonderful supplements that improve the mitocardial uh, contractility and mitochondrial function. Interesting. So what, um, what, life, what diet and lifestyle factors um, 
outside of these specific supplements, like what type of diet is beneficial for improving HDL uh, functionality? Well, you want to use a low refined carbohydrate intake. Um, sugar intake should be less than 25, excuse me, 25 grams a day, which is pretty strict. Um, a lot of vegetables, at least probably eight servings of multicolored vegetables per day. That's got all your phytonutrients, high quality uh, protein that has no pesticides, organicides, hormones in it. And so you got to kind of go to wild game for that. And then uh, a wide variety of berries, uh, particularly that are low glycemic index, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, and always pomegranates. So pomegranate seeds, if you're not prone to, you know, dysglycemia, um, you can use the juice, but any pomegranate, whether it's the seeds, the plant or the juice has benefit in atherosclerosis and raising HDL and raising POM. Interesting. A pomegranate is kind of an amazing compound. Seems to have a lot of efficacy in prostate issues as well. Yeah, and it's been shown to actually reverse carotid atherosclerosis in one year. Really? Yeah. Wow. What what's your what's your current um, uh, protocol for patients who come in who have plaque who want to reverse it? We have a very specific protocol. It's called the coronary heart disease plaque regression and coronary artery calcium regression program. We've actually been able not only to stabilize plaque, but actually to reverse it in patients. So we use a, a whole host of things. There's probably about 15 things we use. Uh, I'll give you the name of some of them. We use Neo40, which is a nitric oxide booster. We use Arteriosil, which protects the glycocalyx. Uh, vitamin it like a seaweed... Uh, moss or something like that. CMOS. Well, it's uh, yeah, sort of like that. It's a uh, yeah. it's a uh, glycocalyx with all kinds of uh, glycoproteins in it. Okay, uh, and uh, you can get that from um, a company called Calroy. So Arteriosil. Uh, we use uh, vitamin K two, MK seven, uh, omega three fatty acids. And what's we, what's what's the dosage of, of MK seven? Okay, K two MK seven is a minimum of three hundred sixty micrograms minimum per, per day. So how micrograms. how high might you go? Oh, K two MK seven probably is very safe, even up to thousand two thousand micrograms. Uh, it's really good for reducing coronary calcification and plaque formation. And unlike K1, there's not a significant effect on um, blood thinning? We've never seen any issues with uh, Coumadin or Warfarin with K2MK7. Now, you know, if you got really high doses, it might, but at 360, you know, there's no issues like there is with K1 because that can interfere with the clotting. Uh, but it, it has no issues with uh, the new uh, uh, antithrombotics, the factor 10 inhibitors like Eliquis, you know, those – those are not affected whatsoever by any form of vitamin K, so they're okay. The other things we use are uh, omega-3 fatty acids uh, in high dose. Um, we use one from Biotics Research called EFA Cert Supreme. Then we have a compound called Vascular Cert, which I developed about five years ago with Biotics, and it's really good. It's got like 25 or 30 different compounds in it that improve endothelial function, reduce inflammation, oxidative stress, and so forth. Um, and then we've got curcumin. Uh, we use a very highly absorbable curcumin, uh, quercetin. And then there's a few other things we're throwing in. But that's the primary things that we use for plaque regression. Right. What, 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 how does quercetin have activity in this regard? Quercetin is an amazing nutraceutical. Uh, it has anti-inflammatory effects, antioxidant effects, anti-immune effects. And it's the only compound I know that actually reduces uh, saps. The saps are the uh, sort of like the garbage in the cells. It's, it's so if a cell gets sick, for example, it starts to die and it makes saps. Senescence, it's because senescence proteins. Oh, okay. Senescence proteins. And so these senescent proteins leak out and they kill all the cells around it. So you start to get a fast aging process in the, in the blood vessel or you get a fast aging process in general. So quercetin reduces sap formation. 
So it actually can slow down vascular aging and aging in general. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so you're talking about cleaning out the garbage from cells. Do you think yeah. uh, intermittent fasting or, or fasting can play a role as well? Absolutely. Uh, intermittent fasting of any type. Uh, we've used the ProLon trial. Okay. We published it. We're going to have it. It's going to be published pretty soon, uh, we hope. Uh, but the initial data with fasting in general is um, you can uh, slow down aging. You can actually reduce some of the saps. Um, you can improve stem cell production, increase nitric oxide, and actually maybe even stabilize reverse type 2 diabetics. Really? Wow. Cool. And what, what about the um, benefits of exercise? Can exercise play a role in um, HDL um, functionality and in reversing cardiovascular disease? Absolutely. H, uh, HDL is generally improved in all the parameters we've talked about with uh, resistance and aerobic exercise. Um, in one of the books you mentioned, What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Heart Disease, there's, a, there's two chapters in there on the best form of exercise that we, we developed uh, with one of the, the great, uh, great uh, strength trainers, Charles Poliquin, who unfortunately died uh, right. about a year ago with a heart attack. But um, Charles and I did some clinical trials, and then we wrote uh, together uh, an exercise program, which is published in this book called ABCT, huh. Aerobics Bill, Contour, and Tone. And it's combining aerobics and resistance training with interval training to get the best cardiovascular benefits, protection for coronary heart disease, but also improve your lipid profile and your blood pressure. Interesting. What, what about hormones? Um, I know um, some of the men that I've seen who had the lowest HCL levels were guys who were taking testosterone. Yeah, that's a really tricky topic. Um, I, in my practice, I, I, I have really not done hormones. I just am not trained in hormones and really probably not qualified to even uh, prescribe them and really talk intelligently about them in, in, in sort of sense. So um, I would just say this, when I reviewed the data on hormones and heart disease and hormones and lipids, it's very confusing. It's very controversial. And you can kind of find whatever you want to out there to support your opinion. So I'll leave it at that and let the hormone specialists get into the intricacies of that topic. Yeah. Did you see that paper that Felice Gersh published recently on uh, benefits of estrogen for reversing cardiovascular disease? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of good articles out there that you can read. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, it makes some sense since we know women have much lower rates of heart disease than men until menopause. So yes. we it makes sense that H, uh, that estrogen has somewhat of a protective role. All right, exactly. Cool. And what about any of the medications for HDL? None of them work. Um, you know, there's there's a whole list of things out there. Uh, probably niacin has been sort of the, the primary um, nutraceutical that's been looked at. And niacin actually does work. But it's not really a medication per se. I mean, it's right. obviously, you know, you can get it as a prescription. Right. So you consider it that way, but we don't think but essentially of it. Essentially, it's a vitamin. Good. Right. Niacin actually improves total HDL, HDL particle number, uh, HDL size, and HDL functionality. They're one of the few supplements slash drugs that does that. Most of the other drugs that have been uh, attempted really don't work well. Um, you know, the... Um, there, there was an older, older lipid drug um, that was used in the VA HIT trial, and uh, it raised HDL. And but they didn't even measure, you know, the, the functionality in that study. So we don't really know whether that change in HDL had anything to do with the outcomes. I mean, when you look at all the benefits of niacin, it's pretty amazing. It's one of the few compounds that will increase LDL particle size. It's one of the few compounds that can have measurable effect on LP little a. It's one of the few things that can improve HDL. And yet it's not generally considered uh, something that should be recommended by most cardiologists today. Yeah, and that's a shame, Ben, because uh, it's based on three clinical trials that came out 
that said that a niacin didn't work to reduce coronary heart disease and all these other things. But if you go back and look at all those studies, as you know, you've read them as I have, they're flawed. They have an incredibly bad uh, methodology. Uh, just, I mean, you can take them apart, literally just massacre those trials. If you really know about what they looked at and, and I've, I've written several editorials with a lot of folks uh, that, that tear up the studies and say, look, nice is still a good supplement. It's a good drug. Ever how you want to classify it, you should use it, but you have to know how to use it. You've got to know what dose to give. You got to know what side effects it has and what to monitor. And if you know how to do that, you can be a very wise clinician and use niacin to improve your lipidology and your coronary heart disease risk and a lot of other factors. Yeah, I think if you use niacin as part of the package rather than just rely on a super high dosage of niacin, you can avoid some of the blood sugar, liver stress um, that can occur. Yeah, and you're exactly right. If you keep it in a kind of a low dose and you use it as a combination agent, I mean, I, I don't usually go much over 500 milligrams of niacin in one day, uh, with one exception. In LP little a, that's about the only time, and that's about the only thing that really works. You've got to go to higher doses to get LP little a down. But for the other things we've talked about, 500 milligrams used with other compounds is very effective, and you don't get the hyperhomocysteinemia, the hyperglycemia, the liver dysfunction, the itching, the puritis, all that stuff is not very very bad. Yeah. LP little a is a tough one. Anything new on the horizon for that? Well, it's interesting. You should ask me that because uh, our next clinical trial uh, product development will be with LP little a, and we'll be working again with metagenics on that one. So since we finished the HDL trial, I hope that we'll be starting the LP little a study. Let, let, but, me, let but me guess. There is a, there is a drug. There is a drug being developed and right. it's on fast track, as you know, uh, that could be out within one to two years if everything goes well. Right. Then all of a sudden, uh, you know, all the conventional MDs will want to measure LP little a. But right now, you try to get it measured. You're like, right. hey, what are you doing that for? It's a genetic. Once we, once we get the drug for it, people will start measuring. <laughs> <laughs> kind of backwards thinking. Well, let me guess. Niacin, L-carnitine, um, Let's see, vitamin C, um, lysine. No, what? what yeah, so uh, for what we've got right now, we've got niacin, NAC, okay. uh, arona berry, arona berry, which is choke berry. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it, that works. Actually, it doesn't work all the time, but it works pretty okay. good. And you mentioned the others. There's a Linus Pauling protocol, vitamin C, lysine, proline, carnitine, uh, CoQ10. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, things that may work, right. but none of them are consistent. That's the problem. Right. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, I, I think that's the things I really wanted to talk about here. Um, any final thoughts you want to leave our listeners and viewers? I think you've covered a topic yeah. incredibly well, Ben. You've, you've asked all the pertinent questions and I think we're, that's kind of the state of the art right now. Now you and I both know it could change in a month, but at least after today, we're up to date. So uh, it, it, are there any conferences that are going to occur this year or is that going to be? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're, uh, we're getting back online. Uh, we're going to probably have a 4 M in Las Vegas in December. I oh, think really? that's going to happen. Oh, and wow. we may actually have something even in the fall if uh, this pandemic ends. But I, I think the, uh, virtual meetings are going to phase out and we'll finally get back to live ones pretty soon. By, by, by the way, I, I know I said we we're going to wrap this up, but um, have you had any long COVID patients with cardiovascular issues and do you have any insights on that? Uh, I will give you my insight. Um, I have had uh, not very many patients in, in Tennessee. I, I live in Nashville. So our, at least in my practice, I haven't had a lot of patients who've had COVID. I've had a few, but um, excuse me just a second. The, uh, I think the reason I haven't had a lot of people in my practice with it is because we had a lot of patients on high dose vitamin D plus a lot of nutraceuticals. Right. They were healthy people in that respect. And so that was a protective thing. But the ones who did get COVID, none of them got very sick with it. Very few of them even ended up um, having more than like a seven day 
period. They they uh, they quarantined, but they stayed at home. Almost none of them ended up in the hospital. But I've had a few that have ended up in the hospital. Um, have you had any that had the long term? Uh, uh, we've had a few people that had had, I would say, more short term stuff. Okay. With uh, you know, shorts of breath, but I haven't really seen any long term in my practice like long term effects with cardiac dysfunction or pulmonary okay. dysfunction. Okay, cool. Yeah. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Oh, probably go to my website. It's okay. The, it's, it's got everything on there. It's uh, hypertensioninstitute.com. Uh, our website's very user friendly. You can find our emails, phone numbers. Uh, all our protocols, uh, books, and so forth are on there. And once again, the product from Metagenics for HDL is Called Cardio Lux, C A R D I O L U X, Cardio Lux. And, and that's currently available. It's available through Metagenics presently, yes. And the dosage that you recommend for that? It's two twice a day with food. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. My pleasure, man. Well, thank you, listeners for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. Please take a few minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star ratings and review. That would really help us so more people can find us in their listing of health podcasts. I'd also like to let everybody know that I now have a few openings for new clients for nutritional consultations. If you're interested, please call my office in Santa Monica at 310-395-3111. That's 310-395-3111. And take one of the uh, few openings we have now for a individual consultation for nutrition with Dr. Ben Weitz. Thank you and see you next week.